Hey everybody, it's Carm here. I'm back on a Friday afternoon, about halfway through the month here, settle into the season, and I uh, want to come on and share a group I've uh, been enjoying for the last uh, couple weeks, really, or I should say for the last 30 years, but listening to quite a bit in the last uh, couple weeks. Uh, Coyote Oldman, uh, made up of uh, a fellow named Michael Graham Allen and Barry Stramp. Uh, Michael, being a self-taught flute player, uh, flute designer and builder, uh, sculptor overall, and uh, Barry Stramp, also a flute player, uh, sound engineer, uh, really a overall uh, studio whiz in the way he uh, processes sound. And um, the two of them together have made some, uh, to me, some, some of the deepest what an incredible blend of ancient and uh, futuristic. Uh, really, well, there's those two coalesce in such a way that I don't think I've ever heard in, in other kinds of music, just the way they blend. And um, I first heard them in the summer of 1990 off of uh, Musical Star Streams. And uh, yeah, just uh, it's a great way to start the journey with them. Uh, I'll first actually uh, show an article I've had for quite a long time here. March 95 edition of Body, Mind, and Spirit. She had a nice article on uh, Michael Graham Allen, who's the founding me member of the group, really. Uh, Barry Stramp would play on um, the majority of the albums, or at least over half, but mainly, uh, I think it was mainly his group for the most part. See this quote there, some statistics. His doggy. And these are his um, his own uh, creations, uh, based on uh, kind of archaeological artifacts, ancient flutes of uh, North and South America, uh, you know, handcrafted, very much his own design and approach. A yeah, really nice article, you know, speaking about his own his own inspiration and his own uh, history with the instrument. He met, uh, met Barry Stramp in the early 80s and uh, started making recordings uh, later in the decade, in the mid-80s. And uh, yeah, that's where, where it started with them. He's, uh, I think he's based out of uh, Arkansas himself. So for a while they were in, uh, I think it was Norman, Oklahoma. I don't have their first album. Uh, Night Forest. I've heard it, and it starts off pretty basic, kind of like you would have with maybe R. Carlos Nakai, if you know him, uh, you know, solo cedar flute. But then what Barry would do, uh, as well as playing flute, he also would do this kind of real-time sound processing, like with foot pedals, where it would uh, kind of multiply the sound of the flutes, uh, the various lines, uh, you're making it sound like chords or just various um, uh, just additional voicings having this kind of ghostly effect uh, you know, adding in the harmonic richness and complexity of what they were doing overall again making it kind of sound incredible merging of the ancient and uh, futuristic so you can kind of hear it already on the beginning there and um, I have the second album here Tear of the Moon which kind of continues that this is actually the very first album I ever bought of theirs on this tape here, way back when. But yeah, you could hear them really uh, exploring not just the ancient properties of the instruments, what they were based on, but uh, the studio as an instrument, you know, the way they uh, blended it together. Uh, to me, this one has this kind of aquatic feel to it, almost like they're playing underwater or kind of what could be, you know, an alternate universe uh, underwater sound. And uh, kind of like the cover. Uh, very just kind of deep, uh, dark and beautiful. And Tear of the Moon. Pretty good place to start with them if uh, you're not familiar. And next up, uh, oh, that one's from 1987. This one's from 88. A Landscape. And that's uh, what's playing in the background, if you could hear it. On here they add, um, as well as the flutes, there's also a little bit of uh, percussion from uh, Barry Stramp, as well as the Chapman stick, 
which you could hear um, Michael's playing the lead voice on flute and Barry's playing the in kind of a percussive way, playing the stick. So adding a little in the instrumentation, but still re retaining that basic approach that they have uh, together. Flutes here. But, uh, yeah, and landscape. Quite a bit here, so won't take too long with these. Well, I don't know if I showed. Um, I don't know if I showed the picture. We showed them two together. Hey, you have uh, Barry here on the pan pipes and uh, Michael. Another thing too with Barry, uh, his approach on the pan pipe, stretching that out sonically in the studio making it sound not like you traditionally associate with the pan pipes like um, is it Zem, Zemfir is it? Much different approach. Um, I think of it almost like a tambora playing that role, um, a kind of drone but with more harmonic variation and uh, it's kind of a very deep bed for everything else to travel on and you really hear it on uh, uh, Thunder Chord here from 1990. Now this is my introduction to them as far as listening what I'd heard on musical star streams featured back then in the summer of 90. Uh, this takes it even further from previous albums uh, as far as the complexity of uh, the actual construction of the music and the way they uh, the way they interact and the depth of it is so not just the depth of the instruments themselves what they're doing sonically but emotionally it's really like they're calling down to something ancient you know, within themselves, but finding a way to merge that with the technology. It never sounds stilted or um, like a gimmick, but just very, um, very real and very much an expression of what they're what they're feeling uh, during those moments. A listing of the instruments here. The uh, thunder chord itself, the title cut, uses a 10 by 4 uh, titanium uh, sheet of metal to. Uh, yeah, simulate the sound of sound of thunder, so that's very uh, yeah, it's quite another dimension to it. Uh, I'd say a great introduction to their music overall if you're not familiar, and you want to jump right into right into the deep end, so to speak. Uh, this is um, it's the one to start with. I'd say, and I'd say it's to some degree it's the one that put them on the map as far as uh, just getting them a little bit out there, a little bit of airplay on star streams uh, helped. Uh, and uh, it's got me into them way back when. Uh, next up from 1982 with In Medicine River. A uh, bit of a departure in that uh, Barry's not on this one. Barry Stramp, which he would kind of come and go from the group at various times depending on what he was working on. And Michael would just continue on solo and collaborate with others. On here, um, uh, additionally, Michael has uh, Michael uh, Fitzsimmons. Who's a percussionist? There's various uh, yeah, log drum, bass drum, bells and shakers, as well as Michael Graham Allen's uh, signature flutes. So it's a little more upbeat and earthy, uh, not as spacey and otherworldly as the previous albums with uh, Barry. And you see Michael with one of his own creations here. It's a C flute, C bass flute, kind of like ancient uh, bassoon looking. But, um, yeah, another side to them that uh, had been previously heard. So if you want to get into something more accessible early on, you know, from early on in their chronology, this would be a good one to start with. And next up, uh, Barry returns to the group and we have Compassion, 1993. Uh, really leaving off where, um, taking up where uh, Thunder Chord left off. So adding some, uh, some different flutes different construction. Uh, really, I think, to me, lending almost a chamber quality, like you would get with a string quartet, maybe. And even some of the flutes do sound like uh, cellos on here. They've got a deep uh, kind of string sonority. And uh, one thing that's also different about this is that they've added a vocalist for a few cuts, uh, Wei Cheng from a Chinese opera. There's a soprano singer who adds another uh, real depth to the music, not just as far as the um, the overall sound field in melodically, but really emotionally. 
Uh, very soul-stirring stuff to hear her voice mixed in with what they're doing with the flutes and uh, the processing. Uh, just, uh, I'd say this, aside from Thundercore, this might be my favorite album of theirs. And um, if you want to get into them more, as far as, I guess, somewhat of a traditional song structure, um, you know, as, as well as being the, the voice there, you know, this would be a good one. But also, you know, really getting a sense of their depth. This is a... Um, it's very powerful. And Compassion from 1993. Next up from 95. Have the Shape of Time. Uh, very much like the cover. Uh, quite spacey. Uh, still having that blend of, you know, the ancient and the futuristic. The one here, it seems like they're taking it even uh, further out uh, texturally. Which, of course, that's really what so much of the music is about, is... Uh, you know, melody, harmony, and texture. And then I hear actually a little bit more rhythm too, since there's a little more percussion coming back into the, the mix overall. I love this. Nice poster. But, um, yeah, the, you know, the story continues with them here. Um, you know, it's still that signature sound, but you hear little subtle differences of, uh, of uh, how they're approaching things. So, The Shape of Time, from 95. Next up, they have a compilation, uh, In Beauty I Walk, the Best of Coyote Oldman, 1997. It's on a Hearts of Space, which I didn't mention that um, most of their previous albums are on their own label, and uh, Thunder Court was reissued on uh, Hearts of Space. It's a real nice overview of what they've done up to this point. Uh, I was going to say they picked the deeper and darker cuts, but that's pretty much the whole uh, catalog. But it even seems this is even more nocturnal the way they uh, sequenced it. And real nice uh, liner notes by uh, Michael Graham Allen himself and uh, John DiLiberto uh, from the show Echoes from Public Radio. Very much championed uh, all kinds of uh, this kind of music. That's a great show, by the way, which uh, remind myself I need to catch up on. It's very accessible as well as um, esoteric, I would say. But yeah, nice, uh, be a nice intro to them. Just getting, looking to try them out. And next up, they're taking another turn. Uh, maybe the most radical one yet, even though this is probably the least radical sounding release, I would say. Floating in the Evening, Songs from Otter River. Again, more of his uh, hand-carved designed flutes here. On here, uh, Barry's not on this one. It's for the most part, it's Michael himself on flute, flutes playing with Horace Williams, who plays piano and uh, acoustic guitar, as well as doing the engineering. Uh, very stripped down, uh, much more acoustic oriented, uh, rather drier overall as far as the recording. Uh, if you know R. Carlos Nakai and Peter Cater's collaborations for a Native American flute and piano, very much along that. Uh, kind of in that style and, and feel, uh, the improvisation and the composition. Uh, yeah, if you want a, like a very stripped back approach to Coyote Oldman and more of what Michael is doing, you know, more soloistically, um, this definitely be a good one to, to check out. I love that. Yeah, songs from Outer River, Floating an Evening from 1998. Next up, returning back to the signature form with uh, Michael and Barry together. Uh, House Made of Dawn, 1999. Uh, they always had this ability, however long they would have been together or apart, whenever they came back together, they always seemed to take up pretty much where they left off and uh, from the previous one. Uh, very much like the cover, very much, uh, very, very expansive. I think even more than on their previous albums, there's a real sense of, I think of it as being like, time being stretched out in a sense, their sound being stretched out over a landscape and just kind of blanketing it and developing it. There's just a constant, this kind of a slow flowing of, of development here, but um, uh, very powerful stuff. Um, you know, kind of a quiet intensity throughout. A lot of this music I would say also is, um, if you wanted to use it for more, you know, like the healing arts, meditation, 
Reiki, you know, various things like that. So much of what they do would be perfect for that. But as well, you could listen to it on a, in a deeper way and hear all these, all these little uh, nuances and uh, like little seedings of other things developing within the music. Um, and not merely for the background, you could really, it could really go both ways. And this is a real nice example of it on uh, this one. Uh, House Made of Dawn from 1999. And next up, they're taking another turn. Uh, 2004, you have Rainbird, which is again Michael mostly solo, uh, playing a Anasazi flute. So, something different from previous recordings is that he's going you know, for a, a flute that he hadn't worked with very much previously, adding a whole new sound and uh, overall to what he's doing. Uh, less layer on, layering on here, being that Barry's not on the album. Uh, somewhat like um, uh, Out of River, he's playing solo. Uh, you, know, you have uh, the reverb and everything, but there's, uh, again, that kind of stripped down approach. This is actually the first album I'd heard of him without Barry at that time. You know, catching up with the other ones later. So I was a little disappointed that it didn't have the signature sound, but it was okay. I, I caught up to the artist eventually, as I often do. So, uh, yeah, Rainbird for another side of uh, what he was doing. 2004. And finally, as far as the uh, albums under Cody Oldman that I have, uh, Under an Ancient Sky, 2008. Now he's back with Barry on this one. And what's interesting about this is that it, well, it does continue on with the previous collaboration between the two of them, but also merges that with what he was doing with Rainbird, and that he's playing the, uh, the Anasazi flute throughout. And for the most part, it's, it's a little more, it's probably the most stripped down of all the recordings I've heard from the two of them. Uh, Barry's studio enhancements and, you know, kind of manipulating the sound, it's a lot more, um, subdued here and much more um, sounds like for the most part he's playing a variation on the same theme throughout each piece you could almost say it's like the same you know piece you're repeated in a sense but also um, you know has a very kind of uh, it's consistent in that way it's not as much variation but it's still it's a nice thing to kind of sit inside of you know uh, luminescence is uh, my personal favorite cut here 18 minutes there. It's another one on Hearts of Space. And, uh, but yeah, you still hear, um, you still hear their, um, in a sense, what made them so distinctive to begin with, even in a subtler way. But, um, yeah, there's no one, uh, no one quite like Kyrie Oldman that I've heard before. Um, just in the way they blend, um, you know, creatively, uh, sonically, it's just, um, yeah, just to meet a one-of-a-kind group. And both artists are just, uh, you know, just uh, never heard anything quite like them. So, yeah, it's Coyote Oldman. Uh, real quick, I want to show just a few things that are related to the group, and kind of side projects. Uh, Sky of Dreams, uh, Barry Stramp. I think this is his only solo album. If you're only going to get into maybe a couple of Coyote Oldman's releases overall, uh, I'd say additionally make this one of them. It's um, just incredible, uh, very much in the mold of what they're doing together, especially early on. This one's from 91. But you could really hear the kind of the bare bones of what Barry does in the studio, uh, playing in real time and then enhancing his own sound, multi-layering in real time using foot pedals, uh, you know, again creating chords and extra textures, uh, very powerful. He uses some of Michael's flutes on here, as well as the Shakuhachi from Japan and uh, Banzuri from India, among other ones, and his, um, his signature pan pipes, which again he doesn't play like quite like anyone else. There's the Barry himself, the signature instrument. This was used also for a, um, a documentary on Ansel Adams, the landscape photographer which is just, if you ever to find a, to see if I could find it and maybe link that, incredible, incredible um, documentary. And the way the music is used evokes it perfectly, if you know his photography. 
think this photography was taken in Arizona, I believe. But yeah, I would definitely uh, check this one out. If you've already listened to some Coyote Oldman and you like what you hear, yes, please uh, please add this to it. It's a wonderful uh, Sky of Dreams, uh, Barry Stramp. We have an album by uh, Michael Fitzsimmons, uh, Light in the Village, uh, the percussionist, uh, lots of uh, hand percussion, shakers, uh, kalimba. Uh, Michael Graham Allen also guests on this, on flutes. Uh, much different than any of the Coyote Oldman albums. Uh, very upbeat and kind of celebratory at times. Uh, pretty much has a light touch throughout. Uh, but you know, with the uh, with the association with the group, uh, definitely work worth uh, looking into. I feel like African percussion, especially, this would definitely be uh, something to look into. Yeah, Michael Fitzsimmons, Light in the Village, uh, from '94. Finally, an album by um, it's got, it's got pretty dark in here all of a sudden. The sun's going away. Uh, Ritual Structures, Mark Tyndall plays kind of a processed, enhanced bass. Uh, both Michael Graham Allen and Barry Stramp are on here. Uh, very deep, dark, probably darker than anything that I've heard Coyote Oldman do. If you know the Fathom label, which was on um, the Hearts of Space uh, branch of the label, very dark, uh, surreal, maybe even noisy, experimental, but done in a slower, more somewhat meditative way. Also a little bit unsettling. I really like the uh, photography here, but another side of what um, what they were doing collaboration-wise with uh, members of Coyote Oldman. So if you really, really want to go into the deep end, <laughs> check this one out. Yeah, Ritual Structures, Mark Tyndall. So yeah, that's uh, the Coyote Oldman collection, that, that uh, group I've been loving for uh, well, 30 years now. and. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I think it's well worth, uh, if you want to hear a different side of uh, experimental music that's also healing as well, I feel. It's been very nourishing during these times and really throughout uh, most of my life. And uh, I just I just love this group and, and the artists. So yeah, yeah Cowdy Oldman. By all means, uh, give a listen. So, just wanted to come on and share this, uh, my latest obsession. And... Um, See what comes next. Always revisiting and uh, exploring and re-exploring. So hope you're all well. Thank you for watching, and you know, to the next one. Peace, love, and joy.